So good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for coming. Um, what we're going to do a bit of a relay here uh, and hand over the baton uh, in, in several changes of uh, speaker. So I'm going to start, uh, then Michaela will talk, and then Josefina will talk, uh, and then in the end will come back to me. Um, so, um, participation and organisational partnering. What we want to do is um, complexify and enrich the, the concept of participation. So we're, we're thinking about participation um, and we want to do it with thinking about the working on this idea that organized, part of the work that organizations do, any organization, uh, is to partner with other organizations. And increasingly, partnering between organizations is more and more important in the work of any organization. And, and in a way, that's an expression of the times that we live in um, and its economy. Uh, what that economy produces, services and knowledge and so on. Uh, so we're thinking about participation as a concept and partnering. And we want to go more deeply into the proposition that we think we find in our university, and I think you have seen it finds in our <coughs> university, uh, that uh, Partnering activities of, of our universities are a means by which they, as large regional organisations, because that's what they are, um, large regional organisations working with knowledge and working with students and knowledge and trying to put those together, um, become or generate economic resources for a region. Okay. So that they become in some senses, uh, both here in Northern Australia and in the rural, uh, drivers of the economy in the region. Okay. So that, that's the sort of big picture that we're working in. So, uh, we're, um, so we're looking at we're looking at the partnering between organisations, partnering between particular sorts of organisations in two very different regions. So we're doing comparative work here. Uh, comparative work between Northern Australia as a region and the rural as a region. Northern Australia uh, is a developing region, still still colonial in some sense. The rural uh, is a Rust Belt region, uh, economically recovering from the decline in heavy industrial, in, uh, he, uh, the decline of the heavy industrial economy and so on. So universities, very different economies, uh, universities trying to intervene. And, and so what we're doing is looking at the community, looking at uh, partnering and trying to reconceptualize participation uh, as part, as an outcome of that empirical work. Of course, partnering is not a new phenomenon, uh, so we didn't really emphasize it as partnering. We thought they were state institutions and we thought they just did their work of working with organisations and people and so on. Uh, and that was part of a very different vision of what a state is and how it relates to an economy uh, and uh, so on. So um, it's, it's not a new phenomenon. Uh, it's just that we haven't really emphasised it as a um, as generative of Participation. We haven't really emphasised it as generative of economic <coughs> activity in the past. Uh, but these are our neoliberal and ordo liberal times that we live in. Um, 
So, uh, a whole proposition, if you like, is that partnering, every partnering is unique, uh, and every unique partnering, partnering of an organisation uh, in, uh, generates uh, or emerges in every uh, unique partnering of an organisation uh, is a unique form of participation. So we think there's a strong link between participation uh, and partnering of organisations. And that's what we want to encourage to uh, investigate. Okay, so um, in the far gone past, in the early 1990s, I was involved uh, in uh, what I called now the partnering of a Indigenous organisation uh, and the state, at the state institutions, Department of Education. So this this is a time when there's a big state. Now we're all told there's a small state. Whether there is or not is a matter of uh, um, well, we need to find that out. But that's the claim that we now have a small state. Um, in in the 1990s, uh, uh, we, there was a, an Indigenous school, school council. It was part of a, um, a state that wanted to devolve power to school boards, school councils. Uh, so a very elaborate and complicated school, Yukon School Council, was formed. Uh, it was resourced. Uh, and it was given real power over curriculum development uh, to, and to direct curriculum. So much power, in fact, that the state uh, held its breath and when the University Council banned mass teaching in the school for a year, uh, it, it was, it happened. Um, so, uh, it was a, a time of radical devolution of state power. Um, of course, soon to follow that uh, was um, neoliberalism, but we didn't know that at the time, so that was what was coming around the corner. Um, so there was negotiations between the Department of Education, between the State Board of Studies, uh, and a new work towards a new radical mass curriculum was started. Uh, then I got an ARC grant to follow this. So these days we can look at it and say, oh, there was partnering between the school council and the State Department of Education and the Board of Studies and the University of Melbourne and so on. We didn't think of it as partnering then. But looking back, you know, we can see it as partnering, uh, and looking back, we can see that unique forms of participation came out of that. Uh, it's, uh, out of this comes Dr. Unifino and Dr. Marika as Australian, as well known figures of Indigenous educators, known in every, store, every school child these days, practically. Um, it was, it was in that organisational partnering, as we can now call it, uh, in which those figures, uh, in the form of hard work by two, by a man and a woman, um, became so, so um, unique forms of participation. And of course, uh, also, I was an outcome, I was a beneficiary, uh, and I'm still trading on it. Talked about it yesterday. I played a video made in the 1990 uh, yesterday in my seminar. Uh, I, I am a direct beneficiary of that participation. And the children who uh, experienced this mass curriculum, they too were beneficiaries. So they were remade. I was remade. Remade in profound ways. Uh, and expand or explicit in that uh, episode 
was an account of the participation we were doing, and it was a yawful account. And the participation we were doing uh, was conceptualized uh, as a yawful form of participation. I was explicitly instructed in it, and, and uh, changed in, in the process. So uh, the form of the uh, um, participation, the, the where or the reconceptualization of uh, participation, the where engaging here, is inspired by your uh, accounts, or your theorization of participation. Um, it's inspired by that. Uh, and of course, it's, it's not that there are not uh, traditions in Western, uh, in the Western Academy that um, are totally remote from this. Uh, there are traditions that we can say, oh, yes, there's some connections here. Uh, we can, this is, uh, our, we can take our inspiration from your world traditions, and we can say, well, it's rather like participation as imagined in active network theory or in material semiotics, uh, and so on. And this sees participation instead of a, a sort of willed individual stepping into a group following his or her interests or after a rational uh, view of what her interests are. Um, and um, so I'm thinking of groups in participation as the assemblage of rational, separate, uh, individual persons. Instead of thinking of participation in that sociological way, which is a, one of many, um, this version of participation conceptualizes it uh, as the organization as a happening. So it's, the organization is a series of happenings. It happens, it happens, it re happens, and re happens. And in that re happening of the organization, uh, individuals, uh, individual persons, if you like, with their relations, uh, in part constituted by their participation, are emergent. So, the vectors go the other way, if you like, instead of, uh, and, and who has the attention and the agency uh, is quite different in this conceptualization. And I'll talk much more about that tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, excuse me. <laughs> um, okay, so what, uh, what we're, when, when I was working at Yurikawa School, I was totally convinced, oh, this is, so, this is all so unique, this form of partnering that we're seeing here, not that I've taught partnering. Uh, these forms of participation uh, are unique. But then I moved on to another Yorma organization, uh, an environmental organization called Dingaru, uh, which was very different, uh, very different forms of organization, connecting and separating, very different forms of participation. And I thought, hmm, okay, this is just as unique. So the proposition is that every organizational partnering and the participations that it engenders is unique. So that we're, we're, we've just got particulars here. And it's an empirical matter what these participations are and what these partnerings are. So it's thoroughly um, empirical. And thoroughly particular, uh, and um, everything is an outcome. Everything is emergent, you might say. Okay, so what we want to do is think about um, universities as partnering organizations. Well, that's one of the things we want to do. So the institutional work that we three are doing here in trying to negotiate uh, an agreement actually a student exchange agreement between Bourbon, uh, Rural University, uh, and um, Charles Darwin University. Um, the institutional
the work and the research are one and the same. Um, so the <laughs> presenting this talk about partnering, partnering participation is itself part of pursuing uh, a partnering agreement between universities. So we're, what we're doing is looking to expand and enrich possibilities of part participation. Since we've got this sense that partnering and participation are co-constituting, well, we're partnering. Uh, so let's think about the participations that are happening here too. So our research concern with the relation between organisational partnering and uh, participation is pursued within universities as partnering organisations. The research work itself is doing what it researches. So, so it's this last little iterative um, thing. And so part of what we do want to do is involve students in the research work uh, that we're partnering around. Uh, in making the student uh, exchange agreement, and what we we'll, what we will do, of course, is we hope produce students with enhanced capacities to participate in, in the organ and um, um, promote the organisations that they go on to join uh, when they graduate. Um, but we, we're hoping for more than that. Um, We've already been working together in several different ways. Josephina and Michaela work together in an open access project. Uh, Helen and Josephine have worked together uh, in the past um, with students in Bohol. Um, uh, and uh, I work with Michaela in uh, Northern Territory partnering organisations. So, and also, or although you don't say it very loud in these days, we're disciplinary colleagues. Uh, uh, so that the discipline we work in is actually an interdiscipline called science and technology studies, uh, which is actively promotes itself as not a discipline. Uh, but because we're in this knowledge community, you could say, we think along the same lines. Uh, so it's a pleasure working with Michaela and So now I'm going to hand it over to Michaela, and she's going to tell you about work that, the drew the work she's doing with Northern Territory Inclusions Organisations, partnering organisations. Thanks, Helen. Yeah. So I guess part of what we're doing from promotion and exchange and partnership <coughs> and all forms of participation is potentially inviting students from Germany to join us in some of our research here. And in relation to that, I'll just think through a little bit of the work that I do working with Indigenous organisations as partnering organisations. And I'm in the Contemporary Indigenous Knowledge and Governance team. We work with many different Indigenous organisations. Um, there's one I work with quite frequently, Yarramundi Finua, Elko Arden, and Gangwinko. Um, some of you may have worked with that organisation yourselves. Um, CVU has got a long history, and Michael's got a long history of working with this organisation. This is their little house, their research hub sitting in the middle of town, recently reconstructed after a cyclone blew over their last one. Qu quickly sprung up again. Um, and they partner in a variety of directions, you could say. These days, Yahoo has two arms, and we've got health research, and, uh, well, uh, health and education services delivery, as well as research. Um, and I think as an organisation, Yahoo has always been very clear about some of the conditions of their partnering. Um, on their website there appears a little video and a description about how you all and Valinda can work together doing research and some of what that involves and some of what Valinda might need to take on in considering 
working, partnering, participating in collective life with young. Okay. So within CDU, we're quite aware of very formal forms of partnering and partnership agreement that have been uh, entered into and I guess staged with young in recent years. I don't know, Petra, if you were there at this moment. No. <laughs> Signing of an MOU between CDU and Government and Menzies in 2016. This was a very significant event, quite a while in the preparation, with many <coughs> significant particular people needing to come together at the same time and place to sign an MOU and commitment to partner together to work together in the future of the future. But what I find when going and working in your home with Government is that there's not just this stage and moments of formal partnering, but Examples of partnering going on all the time and in many different directions. So this is a photo that I took. It's while I was um, visiting Yaluka on a project called the Rekia Project, Remote Engagement and Coordination with Indigenous Evaluation Research. Um, I was there to work with Rosemary Buntanboy and her colleague Mitchell on this project. But while I was there, there were other things going on. They'd recently employed another Alanda worker at Yaru, who was always working collaboratively with um, Indigenous researchers within the organisation, supporting them in their engagement with outside organisations. We have a researcher from Red Cross, sorry, an uh, employee of Red Cross, who is key to maintaining a partnership arrangement between Yonu and Red Cross around their service delivery. And so these people came together to talk about another moment of partnering and, and mutual participation, the PM and C meeting that was about to happen in a few days' time. So a representative from Prime Minister and Cabinet was about to arrive to discuss with this team the work that they will be continuing together into the future. There was a lot of complicated discussion and negotiation around how we, they would talk with this man when he arrived. And in the process of this discussion, at one point, Gunjong Boy turns to me, who's here, taking the photo. Quickly, record this video. Mm -hmm. She remembered in this conversation that there was something very important she wanted to tell this new man from PMC who was about to arrive. I was there think about how to evaluate government engagement. She'd suddenly noticed a moment where government engagement was important and she had something to say about it. So she turns to me and she says, now, sometimes here we are worried when government people come, they stay for one month, two months, and are gone. They come one month, two months, gone. We are concerned that maybe sometimes these people that come in and they leave, maybe they're not suitable for this work. And she elaborated on this a little bit until she realised that she'd said enough, then close off the video. So in this moment where we were sitting together on the veranda at Yaru behind that sort of little hut that you saw, there were so many different forms of partnering in process. And I was sort of caught up in the flux, if you like. There was a moment where one point, a piece of information that was going to be relevant to my project sort of issued out and was captured on the video. Um, but this, it seems to me, is part of the daily life of this organisation as a partnering organisation, working with many other groups and stakeholders as part of their business. So as I continued on with this project, there was a lot more work that we did around considering how government people and your in Yalunku can work together, what good government engagement is. Um, and it involved discussions with many different stakeholders, it involved working with Indigenous researchers to talk to government people from the territory government, those that sat in the East Island of Shire, many different organisations. And as an outcome of that project, government funders that were employing us said, look, you'll trace lots of networks within this community, lots of interactions between different organisations. When our government staff 
from my view, they don't necessarily understand how they might engage with lots of different groups and stakeholders in the community. How can we help them to be able to understand how they can partner appropriately with Jung um, and different normal organisations at the same time as coordinating with other activities that are going on. So we ended up producing this little map. Um, Yahoo is the hub <laughs> in the sense that if you want help to be able to understand the network that you might like to trace when working in a community or some of the networks which are already present and active, you can go to them. <coughs> they are actually experts in helping you participate in this ecology of different part partnerings that are occurring. Um, and so our research sort of framed it in the terms of this talk became very concerned with, with that. What Yahoo is able to offer is just not the capacity to partner with others to do, develop health services or research services, but also to guide others as they navigate complexities of, computer, of community life, try to achieve other outcomes, work on policy development, um, attend the local authority meetings, work with the school, etc., etc. So um, the, the sort of explicit act of value becoming able to help people navigate partnerings is sort of an added string to their bow these days. We've now recommended in the um, report to government that when people travel to this community, when government staff travel to Bella and that maybe they will want to consider the type of network that they will trace. Maybe they might want to consider going to Yoga and some of the researchers there and asking for help. Um, so, yes, to partner with Yoga, but also to ask their advice and guidance around how to, to move um, in their work. So I guess from these few little stories, perhaps there's a couple of things that we can learn about partnering and participation in Yoga and Um it seemed to me, in my experiences, that it's common for, for partnerships or partnerings to produce relationships and effects in multiple different directions. So you're never just engaging with the person in front of you, you're also engaging with many other organisations that they're involved with, as well as many other forms of kinship and clan affiliation. And this is all going on. Um, to be accountable to enhancing networks of kinship and elder authority as well as enhancing organisational capacity through collaboration. So part of working with Yaru is not just, yes, we have some Indigenous researchers working with us. It's also working collaboratively with them around the type of work that we can do that can support networks of authority already present in the community um, as we do that work. Um, I guess learning how to become competent participants, a bit like we might hope the government staff do. Participants in these multiple landscapes is a skill that we might hope students could develop. So people coming to work with us, potentially helping with our projects, um, potentially being mentored to carry out um, various forms of, of research work here in the university, also engaging with us in Indigenous communities, Hope that being able to be a competent participant in some of these landscapes is what they might develop. And there's a sense, I guess we're trying to make the argument that supporting the learning of these students enhances research and institutional capacity in the university as a whole. Um, so capacities around partnering as a sort of a, a various and multiple activity with different effects, um, being able to work with that is as a value or as a resource in a way for the university and something that we might be able to cultivate working from the work that we already do and the experiences that we already have um, and supporting others to, to sort of gain that as well. Um, so I guess that's my little snippet um, from yeah partnering here in Northern Australia and this thing we'll talk about. It. Thank you, Michaela. I will tell a tiny little different story. So it is uh, different in many ways, but we will come to a point where we can talk about those stories together again. This is a um, 
advertisement of neue deutsche organizationen an umbrella organization for my friend special interest organization they do some work for um, two years but they were only funded this year and so they had their opening event and three weeks before the election they named it yala we vote for democracy and registration was necessary, so uh, that's why I registered, uh, registered. And when I get to the registration desk, um, I was given two documents. One was a policy briefing, and the other one was a tiny little postcard. And I was told that I should write my questions on it, and as soon as the parliamentarians would sit there, um, I could indicate someone and they would pick up my questions and bring them to the parliamentarians. Behind them, there was a poster which said that the event has three parts. Um, the first one was about inviting people from these migrant organizations they are working with to talk about their situation. The second part was about talking about the situation of these migrants and migrant organizations to parliamentarians. And the third one was a comedian um, who just lived with the situation after the news. So I looked at their web page and I was quite amazed. They have six tabs on the web page. One of them is get involved. And uh, I was surprised that it's so central to them to, to do partnering, that they're really actively recruiting people to join them. So I got there and, and I found it very interesting. How can I get there? Yeah. So the first part, and that is a screenshot of the <coughs> website. These are some of the partner organizations they are working with. Um, it's a, quite a bit in Berlin, but also here in the rural area and all over the, the country. And there are around 80 um, organizations who are involved with them. Um, when I came there, they invited five people. Uh, one of them was a little man that I called Mr. Vidu. Mr. Uh, Liu was um, a small man from India, he had dark skin, and he talked about his experiences in Berlin in the 1980s. And um, he was telling the story that he wanted to engage politically, that he wanted to come up and organize something, and start an organization, a political organization, but that was not possible at this time. So there were a lot of funding for cultural organizations, and, and the person in the uh, in Berlin's government told him, yes, if you start dancing group, of course you can fund that. If you want to do something about reading or whatever, you can fund that, but not politically. So this is one of the occasions where partnering didn't go well, and of course it had that. At the same time, this same man experienced uh, racial, uh, racist violence every single day. So there was a kind of, of tension that he had to deal with, and he started partnering with other migrant organizations who, um, in the end, they developed this um, umbrella organization. So how did they partner with migrant organization? They did so by working, working with these um, migrant organizations, giving them space to talk about their situation, but also to generate knowledge about the situation and the needs of the migrants and the migrants organization. So I I was witnessing it. I was not only witnessing it, having my little card in my hand as a policy briefing, I was suddenly a participant in that. So they involved me in that. And also while giving them uh, the space and active also as part of support network for these organizations. Then uh, the second part they invited parliamentarians this is this person is um, one of the vice presidents from the um, German Bundestag. She is from the left party, this is from the Green Party, and there were also two other politicians who were there but couldn't stay before and came a little bit later. And they discussed exactly the situations that the migrant organization had just discussed and introduced this, um, before. And um, they ended with asking these parliamentarians if it would be possible after the elections to invite them to their actions and let them talk about their issues. So that is one way, one strategy of doing this kind of partnering. 
They ask for invitation for future meet meetings. They translated their situations and needs in policy briefing. And they address the issues of migrant organizations to relevant political leaders. And again, it's a very different way of partnering, but also participating. So it's, it seems already quite skilled, but it's uh, even more complex. Um, then I thought, OK, I want to work with them. I found that quite impressive, and I asked them, and they said, well, let's meet in a cafe. So that was a very good situation. And we uh, looked for a way of how we can collaborate, how we can work together. And they suggested different ways of how I could work with them, how I could contribute, but also how they could contribute to the academic field. <coughs> Again, they, we discuss very different strategies of partnering, but also that <coughs> um, one was writing article, another one was contributing to applying for grants. Um, I was asked if I could or if I would do interviews with some parliamentarians. Um, I was asked if I would uh, participate in the evaluating of the work of the organization or how to build an infrastructure for migrant organizations all over the country. So what do I learn from this different ways of doing partnering, but also different ways of, um, of um, participation? I, well, working with the new German organizations, I hope to learn about the different partnerings and their unique ways of participating. If students come to join us in this effort, I hope that students become fluent in engaging effectively in very different ways of partnering and um, participating. And if students learn how to do the partnering with organizations, they can support and enhance <coughs> their practice, for instance, through their participating in papers, grants, and evaluations, etc. So this was my and I did to you. <laughs> so, so in concluding, I, I want to, uh, we come back to the partnering of our universities. Uh, which of course is what we your in that field. Um, we want to get away from the idea of student exchange or exchange between universities as a form of intellectual tourism or as edu tourism for the students, uh, which you do actually see quite often uh, assumed. And we want to promote the idea that in partnering CPU uh, along with uh, student exchange as an element in this partnering, um, both the organizations as regional organizations are enhancing their capacities, generating value. Um, so what we take from the partnering work that we do in researching organization partnering participation uh, is to remember that our conception. So, what can we take from it? Okay. So, what can we bring from what Yosemina and uh, Michaela have uh, presented to us? Remember that we're thinking of participation in this rather, uh, in this way, in, inspired by your thinking, uh, where uh, we, we see that, well, we don't go along with the idea that um, individuals and organizations rationally decide to partner to pursue their interests. And of course, you can do it with that. That's not wrong. But uh, there's, a more, there's a different way to uh, conceptualize partnering and participation, which we want to follow. So that rather than seeing individuals and organizations uh, as uh, composed of these units of rational individuals, we see them as generated as interests, as having interests, particular interests, in the actual nitty gritty work of partnering. Uh, but the university will be changed by uh, 
the vice chancellor going out to uh, Elko Island. Um, so, in the happening of these partnering organisations, uh, a we could say democracy will come into effect because uh, we we are thinking about practices of democracy and we think about. Uh, these uh, art groups and participation as literally the on the ground work of doing uh, practices of doing democracy. Of course, in addition to the uh, practices of voting and, uh, and, and representing. So, as we heard from Michaela and uh, Justina, what we take away from the university's partnering is that students, and of course students are a significant part of the work of universities, uh, they will experience enhancement and extension and enrichment of themselves as participators. Um, and of course we as researchers, uh, members of the universities, uh, will be partially remade in the experience and like our students, we hope that we'll have an expanded repertoire, expanded fluency uh, in promoting uh, partnering and thinking about participation. But I think there's more to be generated in the partnering uh, from that. Because my part is the value that's added to the brands of CPU and uh, Wong by partnering. Um, a lot of people put a lot of emphasis on that. Yeah, it may or may not happen. Uh, but the brand is uh, more uh, highly valued because it becomes leveraged in expanded student experience. Um, we think the more interesting and more significant issue is the knowledge that's generated in this partnering in this comparative work that we're doing. Uh, so we're looking to the epistemic outcomes. Uh, and it's public epistemic outcomes. And this is why uh, it's uh, salient to practices of democracy. Um, they're public uh, epistemic outcomes because we're in university. We're not Google, we're not Apple. Uh, we're, we're making um, public uh, public access, um, and so what are these public epistemic outcomes look like? Uh, well, remember that we're doing this empirical work with organisations and uh, in the NT in Germany, looking at the actual nitty gritty uh, work that they're pursuing uh, and. Um, the way in which these engage with uh, political processes to do with parliaments and so on. And these practices uh, can be done in better or worse ways. So it, it's, it's uh, economic. Well, regional development is not just economic development, it is actually lifting up the, the whole. Uh, to think of itself in a different way. Uh, and of course we'll be using various evidence that emerges both in the internal uh, work that <coughs> and Michaela are doing and in our reworking it in thinking about the partnering of universities and the practices of that and what it does and how you know, what forms of knowledge is this that we're producing? It, it's an empirical question. And I think uh, as intellectual property uh, and uh, intellectual work becomes more and more uh, seen as the economic factors and knowledge more as an economic resource, we need, these are some of the things we need to think about. So we're uh, teetering, we sit on the work, on the brink of entering new worlds in this university, uh, and we're trying
coming to um, get a bit of a handle, a bit of traction on the future. Uh, and so thank you for coming to the third <laughs>